الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا مزيدا أما بعد All praises due to Allah The creator The sustainer The cherisher And the provider And we ask Allah the creator To exalt the mention and grant peace And send his blessings upon All the prophets and the messengers Specifically The last The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam And upon those who follow him on his righteous path until the end of time. Ever since the beginning of humanity on earth, there was a battle. There was a battle between truth and falsehood. And each one of these two parties remained and continued to be at each other's necks. The battle started way before, the battle continued, and the battle will continue until the end of time. Each party has a representative speaking on its behalf, pushing its agenda, and ensuring its stability. One may wonder, who are the representatives? Who are the representatives who represent the truth and the falsehood? It's a valid question. It's an excellent question indeed. And in order not to tease you any longer, I will tell you who the representatives were, are, and will continue to be. The representative or the representatives of the truth are none but the prophets of Allah. And I would use the term Allah during the lecture. However, I wish to note that when I say Allah, I'm speaking about the creator of the heavens and the earth. Which if you were to refer to the Bible in the Arabic language, you will find in the book of Genesis, it says in the beginning, In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So that term is unique and is not speaking about a specific or a God that is unique to the Muslims in a sense and not for everybody else. The Creator which we should all believe in, he is the one whom we call Allah. And I would prefer to use that term instead. The prophets of Allah are the representatives of the truth. And then you tell me, who do you think was the representative of falsehood? You can answer. Who? Who? Iblis, what's his name in English? Satan. Satan. Of course some people don't believe in Satan. But then again, how could you not? Iblis, he was the representative of falsehood. And he has many, 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 many followers working for his network. They have no vacation, they take no time off, and they don't even get paid. Hard-working employees, ensuring that the rest of the people don't succeed, neither in this life, nor in the life to come. Truth and falsehood contain within them many degrees and dimensions. There are many degrees of truth and many dimensions of truth and there are many degrees of falsehood and many dimensions of falsehood. The epitome, the epitome of truth is believing in the one true creator. 
recognizing His greatness and uniqueness, accepting His beautiful names and perfect attributes, and establishing worship and servitude accordingly. That is the epitome of truth. The most important thing to acquire in one's life prior to one's departure. And this particular epitome of truth is negated by the epitome of falsehood. And the epitome of falsehood is the opposite of all of that. It is not recognizing or believing in the existence of the Creator, nor acknowledging His names and attributes, and surely not establishing worship and servitude to Him. However, when it comes to falsehood, that reality manifests and takes on thousands and thousands of forms. In fact, human beings have managed to be innovative beyond what we can even perceive when it came to the different ways in which they established this form of falsehood and ignored the truth. It is amazing how many different ways one can disbelieve in what one should believe in. And history says it all. If you do study history, it may not be your favorite subject, but I'm not necessarily referring to a, a class you take in university. History now has become available on the net for everybody. If we don't bother to read, then we will be ignorant of many facts. And when we are ignorant of facts, we are not rightly guided. And so there's a common relationship between knowledge and guidance, as we will see later on in the talk, inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> now, let us go back in history, speaking of that, to the very first stages where the battle between truth and falsehood was initiated and became dominant in humans' lives. Noah. Noah, in Arabic, Nuh, alayhi salam. What was his condition with his people? We learn historically that when Allah sent Adam and Eve down to earth, human beings were monotheistic as per the natural disposition of human beings. As in, if you were to be born on an island, that island had absolutely no technology. In fact, you never read a book, you never watched TV, you never spoke to a human being, never went to school. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, you were born on an island to some parents who wind up passing away at a very young age and you manage to survive on this island on your own. You as a human being could not possibly look at a tree and say, this is God. Nor would you believe that God was some different forms into one. Nor would you believe it's the sun or the moon. By natural disposition, by default, if you just observed the universe, if you notice how the sun would rise every single day from the same location, and it would not return. Never did the sun rise and say, oh, I'm tired today. It's too hot. I'm taking a day off. And so it went back down. When you went swimming, you saw that your body even though it's made out of skin, was fit to remain in the water. And you were able to see under the water to a large extent. And you could fish. And you managed to cook the fish and eat. And how does, all, how does this work? How does my body work? How am I able to walk with my feet? How come the skin at the bottom of my feet is compatible? Wherein I can walk on rocks, pebbles, and sometimes glass and not get any cuts. 
if you were just to reflect on yourself, you would believe that there's a single entity managing everything in perfect harmony. Your mind would not go anywhere else. That was the condition of people, monotheistic. Until, what then? وَسُوَاعَ وَيَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرَ Five righteous individuals who passed away. Upon passing away, the representative of falsehood presented himself to the people that remained behind and said, Would you let their memory go? Are you going to let them just disappear? Why don't you erect idols and statues in their resemblance? For what purpose? He gave him a very valid purpose. So that whenever you feel lazy in worship, you can look at these righteous people, you can, you can reminisce on their righteousness, and that will be means for you to worship in the same eagerness as they did. And surely, they did so. And that generation passed with that being the objective of the statues, but it wasn't long before the following generation came and they said, Oh, these are our intercessors with God. These are our intercessors with Allah. هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ Allah." And they became intermediaries between the children of Adam and the Creator. However, from day one, that was not permissible and it will never be permissible and it was never permissible. Because the Creator is so aware, so merciful, so gracious that He has made the relationship between Himself and the creation one where no one in between is needed except examples to be followed such as the Prophets. No other form of an individual trying to help you get to God because you and that individual have the same deficiencies and needs. So going through someone who is as deficient, if not more, is not going to serve any purpose. And this is when polytheism spread. And you all know history. Noah advised them and he invited them to worship the one true God. He was rejected. Many, ch many chances were given. 950 years of propagation and invitation and struggling. And at the end of the day, Allah drowned them all. Because they violated the very purpose of life. They failed to understand that God is one and unique. That Allah does not become His creation and His creation does not become Him. And that the understanding has to be in accordance to His revelation, not our own innovation. And history proves that following prophets came with the same message. Abraham had the same issue with his people worshipping idols. His father on the top of the list. And then Moses. And then none but Jesus. And of course I'm skipping. Otherwise there were 124,000 prophets in between. Many, many prophets were sent. And many, many people disbelieved. But when we speak about Jesus, there has to be a pause. Because introducing the final messenger and his message is closely related to Jesus and his message. Something which we should reflect on according to justice, according to fairness, not according to biased opinions that we pick up because of our desires. One of the main reasons why people don't find the right path is that their desires will prevent them from going on the right path. It takes submission, it takes humbleness, it takes admitting one's faults and mistakes to be able to be rightly guided. I hope you all share these qualities, or at least we'll work on acquiring them soon. Jesus 
peace be upon him, came with a message equal to those who preceded him among the prophets and the messengers. We learn in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 that Moses had said to the people, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And pay attention to the pronoun our. I will elaborate on it when Jesus makes the same statement. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the first commandment. And that is la ilaha illallah. That is what you hear every day when the adhan is called. And that is what every Muslim does when he prays. In fact, that is the summary of our life. We strive on daily basis not to kill you, as some may think. Otherwise, all the non-Muslims would have been dead a long time ago. Can you imagine if every time we met someone, oh, okay, you're next, you're next in line. Go get the machine gun. Everybody would have been dead. No, but Christians have survived in Palestine, and in Lebanon, and in Egypt, and in Syria. In fact, all over the world in Muslim countries. They're still there until now. Neighbors and everything. It wasn't about what they claim. Jesus then, Moses had taught this particular message which embodies what we believe. But then Jesus made the same statements. In Mark chapter 12 verse 29, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? He repeated exactly verbatim what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, or at least what was attributed to him. And some people doubt that. They say, no, there's something else. We say, I know. We hear that all the time. But we somehow cherish the statements of Jesus way too much to be able to leave them alone for the opinion of anyone else, irrespective of who it is. So he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, 18, and so forth, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. In some of the translations, it mentions the law of Moses. They added the word Moses. Whether it is there in the Greek manuscripts or not is irrelevant to us. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Until heavens and earth pass away, not even the stroke of a pen, nothing shall be changed of the law until everything has been achieved. And then he said, so anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever lives the commandments, applies the commandments and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of God. No prayer, no fasting, no paying of charity, no dutifulness to the parents and to the neighbors, no keeping the kinship ties, no mutual respect and kindness, no consideration. If we don't do any of these, according to Jesus, by no means we will enter the kingdom of God. So we take this very seriously. He did not come to destroy what Moses was teaching is what he is teaching. However, the prophets have particular knowledge which we don't have. And because of that knowledge which Jesus was given from Allah, he made it clear to the people that someone shall come after him. And amazingly, not only this is found in the New Testament as per Jesus' statement, rather this is actually found in the Old Testament as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, it says, 
I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, speaking to Moses. Like unto you, like Moses. And will put my words in his mouth. Pay attention. Will put my words in his mouth. And every Muslim knows when you begin to recite the Quran, you say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And if you read the introduction of Surah Al-Najm, the stars, it says, وَالنَّجْمِ وَمَا هَوَى At some point, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى He does not speak of his own desires, it is merely revelation being revealed unto him. It was not his own words. It continues to say, He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not listen to my words, as in the words of Allah, through the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet speaks in my name, I will myself call this person to account. And when the Creator calls one to account, then that person needs to recognize that it is over for them. Because you're not dealing with someone whom you can bribe. You're not dealing with someone who you can get some connections of yours, people to facilitate your affair. It is not a judge in court who may make a mistake and wrong, oppress you, or give you something that you don't deserve. None of the above. You're dealing with the one who knows the seen and the unseen. The hidden and the secret. And that which the breasts conceal. It's a very serious matter. We listen to these words now and we may be somewhat nonchalant about them, but I urge myself and you to reflect on the seriousness of these words. If, if Allah will take this person to account for having rejected the words which he will send through the mouth of the Prophet wasallam, then we need to be very, very wise in our decision making. In John chapter 16, verse 12, so we can refer to the New Testament, Jesus said to his disciples, I have much more to say to you, but you can't bear it now. You're not ready. But when he, the spirit of truth, now this is the tra- one of the translations. It's also known as the comforter. And there's a long discussions among the Muslims and the Christians about the Greek word and uh, whether this is referring to the Holy Ghost or to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. We admit that there's a difference of opinion in interpretation. However, looking at the general picture, we believe it is referring to none but the Prophet ﷺ. Jesus went on to say, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. Repeating what was mentioned in Deuteronomy. He will speak only what he hears from the angel who brings it from Allah. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me. Taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, in support to this statement, "Ana awl al-nas bi'isa ibn Maryam, laysa bayni wa baynahu nabi." I have the most right to Jesus, the son of Mary. There was no prophet in between us. There was no prophet between the two of us. And what nation on earth, other than the Muslims, believe in Jesus? You name any other nation outside of Christianity who love Jesus, believe in Jesus, respect Jesus, and you will find none. You will find the opposite of that. You will find rejection among the Jews and others that he wasn't even a prophet, he was an imposter, he was a liar, and so on and so forth. So which nation glorifies Jesus in this sense? The Muslims. Because we were taught to do so in our book. 
and through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In Matthew twenty one forty three, just in case some have some complaints, Jesus said to his disciples to prove that that will not be among the Holy Spirit followers. That this is in reference to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "Therefore I say unto you." The kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. It will be taken from you. It will be given to another nation. Which nation came after the nation of Jesus? The nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And indeed... 600 years or within 600 years more or less that prophecy was fulfilled the messenger of allah muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent he was declared to be the final messenger that allah will send to mankind none shall come after him except the return of Jesus, which will not be a new prophethood or a new prophet with a new legislation, rather a fulfillment of the life and mission of Jesus and a fulfillment of the major signs of the last day before the end of time. That is the belief which we hold. You can almost visualize... You can almost visualize the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Arabian Peninsula. Specifically around the Kaaba. The Kaaba which was built by none but Abraham and Ishmael for the establishment of worship of the one true creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet has become the, the main location for idolatry. The very problem which we had at the time of Noah continued to exist. The falsehood and its representatives continued to live on and battle the truth until they made it to the very core, the most honorable location for the establishment of the one true creator. It became the place of worship of idols. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never one who got involved in this in any way, shape or form. He was raised as an orphan. He was raised as an orphan. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was deprived of his father and his mother at a very young age. But this is means of training. This is means of preparation from the Creator for the message He will carry. See, you know, if you've lived a different lifestyle, where you suffered a lot, where you had to bear a lot, when difficulties come your way, you have more endurance than those around you who have not experienced what you have experienced. The greater the burden that you carry at a young age, the more perseverance and patience you will have at an old age. This was a divine plan for what will come and what will create what is happening now. What is this? What is this but a manifestation of the patience of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 1400 some years ago? And we praise Allah. He left them alone. He never drank alcohol. He never fornicated. He never lied. He never cheated. He was known of having the most perfect character a human being can have prior to revelation. So much so that two titles, which are based on adjectives, were given to him. As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. As-Sadiq, the truthful one. Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. He was truthful in his speech. He was reliable and he was, whatever you entrusted him with, he would maintain the trust. He was not a traitor. 
He was not treacherous. He would never betray. And so when the Quraysh's wanted to rebuild the Kaaba because of a flood, which had happened in Mecca, and they reached the point where they wanted to place back the black stone, and they differed amongst themselves as for the tribes, which one should be the one that will get the honor to place back the black stone in the Kaaba? It wasn't an issue that could be resolved easily. And while they are in a state of dispute, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam enters upon them, and they all unanimously agree that whatever he decides, whatever advice he gives, they will act upon it. And what was that wise and noble advice? Bring a cloth and put the black stone on it and let each one of the tribe's representatives carry and hold on to a side of the cloth so that everyone is involved in this honor. Maybe you and I would not be able to think in this fashion. We may prioritize based on nationality, based on skin color, based on some other reason why we would favor this tribe over the other one. That was not the messenger of Allah from way before. And so after they put it, they asked him then to place it himself. They all carried the cloth. He placed it himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of the constant idolatry around him, he started to frequent a cave known as Hira, Gharu Hira wherein he would be in seclusion reflecting on the creation of the Creator. And he would do this often, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until that one day in the month of Ramadan, the blessed month of Ramadan, on a night of decree, the angel Gabriel was sent to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he came to him, he said, Iqra, recite. Because some people translate it as read. And they say, how was he asked to read when he was illiterate? Say, Iqra does not mean necessarily read. It also means recite. Subsequently, the Quran is that which is recited. Kitab is that which is written in a book. Recite. He said, Ma ana I am not one who can recite. What do you want me to recite? So he embraced him until he thought he would die. Then he let go of him and he told him a second time, recite. He said, what shall I recite? Then he embraced him a second time. And then a third time. And then the first words which Allah sent down as guidance for humanity until the end of time were اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم Recite in the name of your Lord who created Created the human being from a clot Recite, and your Lord is the most noble who taught with the pen that which human beings did not know. Look at the pen and the effect of the pen in human history. The very first thing which was revealed was identifying the Lordship of the Creator and acquiring knowledge and recognizing that we came from nothing but a blood clot and let's use some more odd terminology excuse me we all came from a sperm can you imagine a sperm which is the most the thing you can resemble it to is mucus you blow your nose it's the same thing you can't differentiate between them all of a sudden this sperm became a walking and talking human being with mind and intellect, with ability to analyze, reflect, make decisions. What is this? Did that come by chance? Is it just a coincidence? No. It is a divine plan. And these were the first words to be revealed. 
The Prophet ﷺ panicked. What would you do if an angel who had 600 wings and who covered the horizon came to you? You would panic as well. And he ran back to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. And he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me up, cover me up. And she gave him words of comfort. She comforted him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she took him to Waraq ibn Nawfal, her cousin, and some say her uncle, who was an Arab idolater who had converted to Christianity and had knowledge of the scriptures. And when he told him, the Prophet Muhammad told him what happened to him, he said, this is the same angel which was sent to Moses. And by Allah, by Allah, if I were young, I wish I were young, so that I can be with you when your people will drive you out. He said, and my people are going to drive me out. He said, no one came with that which you have been given, except that their people drove him out. And they sure did. And so over 23 years, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to receive revelation. The Quran was revealed over the period of 23 years, establishing, establishing the oneness and uniqueness of Allah. Establishing the belief in the angels, establishing the belief in the prophets and the messengers which preceded the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, establishing the belief in accountability, establishing the belief in decree. Twenty-three years, a book, and what do we know about this book? Allow me. Allow me to share what many people have not yet recognized. And I hope that this will be means for them to recognize it. What do you know about the Quran? Besides the fact that out there on the booth, don't look right now, they have some copies for you, which you may pick up or may not. What do you really know about the Qur'an? Is it a book which one can read to find some mistakes in and then present it? No way, Jose. Can't do it. Can try, but it's not going to happen. And I will tell you why in a little bit. Once they fix the voice or the sound. Just leave it, man. I'm losing my concentration. The Quran is the eternal miracle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You see, every prophet or messenger was given something, something relevant to his people. At the time of Moses, magic was prevalent. Magicians had a lot of power, and they really influenced the people. So the miracle of Moses was that which magicians could not deal with. Magicians could make a stick appear to be a snake, but they could not make a snake, a stick become a snake and devour others. Nor could they make it split the ocean. Nor could they make it split the ocean, nor could they make it strike a stone and water would gush out. So Allah gave Moses a miracle which was relevant to his time so that the people identify this as a prophet of Allah. At the time of Jesus, it was a time of medicine. Medicine was prevalent, being able to cure particular diseases and so on and so forth. And so Jesus was given something that no doctor can do. He gave life to the dead by the will of Allah. No doctor, no matter how skillful he is, even if he graduated from Nottingham, I don't know if you have doctors here, he can't do it. And when the person's dying, he's just going to stand there and say, um, rest in peace. <laughs> what can you do? For someone to come to a dead person and bring him back to life, you know this is from the Creator. That was the miracle of Jesus. Great. 
Now you say this to someone who doesn't believe in God, period. And there's a very logical question that they usually ask. Which is, do you have it on your iPhone? I'm sorry, on your Android? Can you show me when Moses did that? Or can you show me when Jesus did that? And what can you say as a believer, whether you're a Muslim or a Christian, what can you say? Um, no, I, I, I don't have any footage, sorry. Is it on Discovery Channel? Nope, it's not there either. So how do you believe in fairy tales? He can tell you, you just believe in any story, anybody can write a story and then you're expected to believe. It's a tough one to answer. Faith will make you believe, but you can't prove it. Because of this issue, the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ being the final was one which does not require anyone to say, prove it to me. I didn't see it, I didn't meet him. As soon as they say, prove it to me, we say, sure. Here's the Quran. It's alive. And it remained behind. And you meeting the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is not necessary for you to receive the revelation of God to him. The revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's eternal because it doesn't end and it's a miracle because it's beyond human ability. That which is supernatural. What do we know about the Quran? Sometimes the non-Muslims think we're freaks, I'll tell you. We're some weird freaky people. What is the matter with these people in this Quran, this big deal about a book, it's just a book. You know, some, somebody claims that they will burn the Quran and the next day there are riots. Now whether that should be done or not, that's another discussion. Is that something that a Muslim does? Is that an adequate behavior? That we run in the streets and destroy, you know, burn tires and destroy public property? Is this, is this how the Prophet ﷺ behaved? No. So, a disclaimer. When the Muslims act in this fashion, it's an independent behavior that is not relevant to the teachings of the Quran. That is not how we behave. Or at least, that's not how we're supposed to behave. So then, why do we make a big deal about the Quran? What's the big deal about the Quran? I'll tell you. It is so precious to us that nothing I say in words can express it. I can't. Because how would you feel? Let me give you a, a worldly example, even though it's nothing. We can think, think of the greatest superstar in the world. Okay? Even though I may disagree whether they are stars. Because stars are supposed to illuminate and show you some guidance. But many of the superstars today are burnt. And so they burn you. You try to be like them, and you will go down like them. But, for the purpose of entertainment, the biggest superstar, who can you think of? Don't tell me, keep it in your mind. <laughs> so we're gonna hear a thousand answers. Oh, Michael Jackson, uh, Michael Jordan, whatever. Anyways, Let's say this person, this person became your buddy and he wrote on a piece of paper. Now everybody is dying to meet this person. He's the most wanted person in the world. He's the biggest celebrity. He's the biggest superstar. And he writes a letter to you, a friendly letter. We're not talking about male and female now. A friendly letter, I love you very much. Okay, By, with your name. I love you very much, you're, my, you're, you're, you're more important to me than me, and I would give my life to you. How would you feel? You walk around on campus like this. Sorry. Say, so what happened? Look man, I got a paper from Batih, whatever his name is. He said to me that he loves me, not you, that I am ABC, say wow. And really, the next day, you'll be the coolest person on campus. 
Every time you walk, by the way, this is the guy, man. They want them. You can't sleep at night. You wake up in the morning, look in the mirror. Yes. That's me. You know I'm serious. And you know this is true. And this is a human being who could be high on drugs half of his life. He wrote it when he was so high, he didn't know what he was writing. In fact, he was writing it for someone else, but he put your name by mistake. That's how he would feel. So if you feel so special, if you had a sentence from a celebrity, then how do you think we Muslims feel when we have the speech of Allah Himself? Preserved and protected. As much as they would like to change it, they can't. It's just not possible. You know what kind of feeling that would give you? When there's something that you don't need security, you don't need bodyguards, you don't need anything, you just have faith that it will remain the way it is because of a promise from the one who made it, from the one who revealed it, I'm sorry, from the one who revealed it. It's a speech. What kind of peace of mind would you have? It's something which we cannot explain. This is what we Muslims believe. And you have the right to doubt. Say, so yeah, that's very nice. Of course you're going to say that because you're a Muslim. And this is your book. And every person, every follower of every religion will claim his book is superior to everybody else's. However, I insist that the Qur'an is unique and that the standards which we apply to evaluate the authority of a book when applied there is absolutely no parallel and no match to the book of Allah let me give you some reasons number one reason the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was unlettered he was one who could not read nor write. And nowadays, while we can read and write, having studied the whole year, when you are about to take your exams, all the information seems to evaporate. This is with your ability to read and write. Let's assume you couldn't read nor write. You were just such an excellent listener, attending the classes. What do you think you will do during the exam? Not, not very well. So how is it that a book that has over 66,000 ayat, some call them verses, fine. It's not a verse because verse is poetry. And it is not poetry. But just for the sake of understanding, 66 plus thousand ayat, 114 surah or chapters, how could an unlettered man write it? It just doesn't happen. And this, this is historically proven that he was unlettered. And no one has ever been able to prove otherwise. That's number one reason. Number two reason, the Prophet ﷺ was very humble. As we learned earlier on, he was a humble person. And you read the Qur'an, you read some of these words, and you have no choice but to feel that these words are coming from such powerful authority that you as a human being feel like you're about to crumble and fall. Who else can say, فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ دَارًا تَلَظَّى Then I warn you of a hellfire which is blazing. Who can come and speak to the people in this fashion? Who can say to the people, إِنَّنِي أَنَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدْنِي وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لَذِكْرِي it is, it is me. Allah, there is no other object of worship but myself. So establish worship and establish the prayer for my remembrance. Who could address the people and warn them against the hellfire and punishment? Who can promise them paradise when the person himself is too humble to even disrespect someone? Number three, the Qur'an speaks of history. If you, any person who is fair and square, were to evaluate history prior to the Qur'an, 
and then look at the Quranic references of, of historical facts will definitely bring to mind the fact that this Quran is consistent with history and not the other way around. Allah says in regards to that, تِلْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الْغَيْبِ نُوحِيهَا إِلَيْكَ مَا كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُهَا أَنْتَ وَلَا قَوْمُكَ فَاصْبِرْ إِنَّ الْعَاقِبَةَ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ this is from the news of the unseen which we reveal unto you. Neither yourself nor did your people know anything about it. So be patient because the good end is for the God conscious and the righteous. Had this been a lie, then the people at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have come to him and said, what do you mean we don't know of these things in the past? Yes, we do know of them. This is one of the evidences regarding history which people didn't even know. Things pertaining to Jesus' birth, for example, how he was born, how he defended his mother as a baby, things which you can find in Surah Maryam, and many other examples. The Quran not only speaks about past, but it also prophesizes the future. It speaks about events which were yet to come, and they were exemplified, and they manifest just as mentioned in the Quran. The Qur'an spoke about scientific facts which people try to dispute but they're really indisputable. The Qur'an spoke about the expansion. And the heavens we constructed with strength and verily we will be expanding them. Now we have two individuals, two teams of astronomers, one led by Saul Perlmutter and another one by Alex Filipenko. And these are supposed to be the leaders in this field. They confirm that the universe which we live in is expanding as we speak right now. Who in the world would have known that? Or who would take a risk? Let's say the Prophet Muhammad was just taking risks. What would be the consequence if he was to throw something out like that and then it doesn't materialize? It is not discovered. They will debunk the whole theory and the whole Quran. It's a very, very sensitive issue which we need to reflect on. The Quran has no contradictions and this is one of the most powerful points. Allah says in the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not consider the Qur'an with care? Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? Do they not ponder upon the speech of Allah? Had it been from other than Allah, they would have surely found therein much contradiction and discrepancy. If that book was from other than Allah, meaning Allah is setting down some standards. If you want to know whether a book is from God or not, whether it has been preserved or not, then look at the contradictions and discrepancy. If you find contradictions that could not be, could not be explained through each other, it is definitely not from God or it is from God initially. However, there's human temper. Human tampering of the text, there's insertion, there's other things, altering of the text, which made it, rendered it no longer a preserved revelation, even though originally it may have been, like the gospel of Jesus. And no one has been able to find a contradiction. What the people have found is that they use the translation of Yusuf Ali, and then one of Sahih International, they say, Ha! Look at the word here. And look at the word there. We say, set aside the translation, leave the translation, come to the Arabic text. You find me now another one with a variation in the text, in a sense, not in pronunciation, as in a chapter missing, an ayah missing, a word missing. No one will be able to do so. Nor will you find the teachings conflicting with one another, rather they are harmonious with one another. The Qur'an has been memorized by so many, it is something that is amazing. You do know that the Arabs constitute 
around, according to statistics, whether they are accurate or not, 13% of the Muslim population. Arabs are around 13% of the Muslim population, which leaves 87 non-Arabs. Now, let's assume that some government which doesn't like Muslims, which is almost every government in the world, Right? If they said, let's come together and this Quran is an evil book, it's a book of terrorism, and it's a book of devil, and what have you, and let's burn them all. Let's burn them all. And let's say they're able to do so. They manage. They go to every mosque and every home, and you know, they get every phone because now they have them on you know, applications. They somehow rid the whole world of the Quran. So that we Muslims are walking around, right? can anyone get one copy? Nope. All gone. Are we in trouble? No. Surprise. <laughs> what do we do? We bring one of the Sri Lankan, Malaysian, Filipino, American, British, Chinese, whatever you want. Hafiz. A memorizer of the whole Quran from cover to cover. Do we have one, two, three? We have tens of thousands. Whom, if you were to speak Arabic with, they can't speak Arabic. They cannot speak Arabic, but they've memorized the book in a foreign language. You can even memorize the algebra in the same language you speak. You can memorize the formulas in physics in the same language you speak. Would you be able to memorize a book in a foreign language? Can you imagine that you know you don't speak Urdu and you memorize a whole book in Urdu? If you did, people would think you're an amazing person. Say, did you see this person? He memorized a whole book in Urdu, he doesn't speak Urdu. We say this is impossible. But we have tens of, tens of, tens of thousands who have memorized the Quran. What would we do? We would bring one of them, say, uh, can you please begin? from the very first chapter, and we will sit down, and he will read the whole Quran, and we will write it down. Not only that, he may make a mistake. He may say, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهَ أَحَدْ And 10 million Muslims will tell him, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ And maybe some will beat him afterwards. <laughs> How dare you change the book of Allah? Oh, I didn't mean it, brother. Okay, khalas, we forgive you. It's that technical. The diacritics, the very short vowels, the small vowels. Muslims have them all memorized. We will write down the book and the next day it will be in, you know, published in, with the new publishers. And we're back on track. Can anyone do this to any other book on earth? I promise you, no. Not even Shakespeare's. Not even Shakespeare's. So what book does ha has that privilege? People don't reflect upon this, but it deserves a lot of reflection. The last one which I will share because I don't want to consume my time is the fact that the Quran presents a challenge and then it presents the result of the challenge simultaneously. The Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Maybe the third page or so. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ When people doubted that that was a speech of Allah being, re being recited by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they claimed he was a magician, they claimed he was a soothsayer, they claimed he was a poet, and they tried to stick all kinds of accusations against him in order to reject worshipping the one true God, because they liked idolatry. So Allah revealed this ayah. There were many others, but this in particular. And if you, this is Allah addressing now humanity. Pay attention. This is your creator addressing humanity from the first time, from the time of revelation until the end of time. Listen very carefully to this challenge. And if you are in doubt, 
Because some are in doubt in regards to that which we have revealed upon our servant. Then produce a chapter the like thereof. One will say a chapter, that may be many pages. I can't do that. Say, don't worry, it's a lot easier than that. The smallest chapter in the Quran is a line and a half. Three verses, ten words. Surah Al-Kawthar. It reads, Inna a'tainaka al-kawthar. Three. Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. Six. Inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar. Ten words, three verses, a line and a half. Produce a chapter the like thereof. Not only that. And call on to your witnesses, as in your assistants, anyone in the world, the biggest authors, the biggest intellectuals, the biggest philosophers, the most eloquent of people, bring all of them together in a joint effort. Bring them and let them produce a chapter in Kuntum Sadiqeen, if you are saying the truth. Now, you see this challenge? Can you imagine a human being writing a book? Whoever it is. Can a human being write a book and in the introduction of the book he says, this is the best book ever written. I challenge anyone to write a sentence like my book. Instead they say, if you find any errors, email us at manymistakes.com. Because if one were to do so, if one was to make this very strong and challenging challenge, and the very next day they discover someone more eloquent, his career is done. He will become the joke. You said that no one can write a sentence. Your book sucks. Look at this guy. He's much better than you. So no human being will dare but let's say a human being dared. Let's say some people go that extra mile and they make that challenge. Will they be able to give you the result of the challenge? No. The next verse says, so if you're unable to do it, conditional, then you will never be able to do it. Ouch. That one hurt. The, the challenge is saying to all of mankind, you will never be able to do it. All of you together, working together, cannot make one chapter like the, this Quran. And if you're unable to do so, then it says, then protect yourselves from the hellfire. You see how, you see how powerful this is? Now, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that 1400 years since that was revealed, not a single human being was able to meet this challenge? And did you know that if one human being were to meet this challenge, there would be no more Muslims in the world? Which is what they want. Instead of fighting the Muslims and bombing them, just bring a chapter like the Quran, we will leave Islam the next day. Because according to our book, the challenge has been met. And we have nothing else to say. But I tell you what, it's not going to happen. It will never happen because Allah said, you will never be able to happen. So now we are 1433 years since then. And until the end of time, we will remain in the same condition. It's not going to change. The question is, are you going to change? Are you going to recognize? Are you going to submit? Some people think that, you know, Muslims are just pushing their, trying to shove their religion down our throats. As if we will make some money if you become a Muslim. Or there's some sort of, I don't know, competition. Believe me, it is very difficult to tell people to accept your faith. Because you often offend them when you don't want to offend them. And you sometimes have to compromise your friendship. In fact, jeopardize your relationship. Because some people just don't like to be told what to believe and what to do and what to think. It's a very difficult task. But had we not cared from the bottom of our hearts, we would have said absolutely nothing.
We would mind our business, say we go to heaven by ourselves because that's what we have and everybody can go to hell. But that's not our attitude. I have to stand here and they have to, the organizers have to go through all this knowing the sensitivity, knowing the difficulty, knowing what is at stake because we are at the end of the day the representatives of the truth and we have to stand against the representatives of falsehood. Because it is not about being nice, it's about being real. Because on the day of judgment, me being nice to you without telling you the truth is a form of betrayal that I will be held to account for. And like I quoted earlier, I'm not ready for it. So don't think we're trying to impose anything in the sense we just care so much that we take the chance to tell you exactly how we feel. And you as a fair person should appreciate that and set aside emotionalism which may make you offended. Appreciate the, the intent and appreciate it through your intellect because it takes some courage. But don't get your feelings hurt because the intent is not to get the feelings hurt. But the truth is bitter sometimes. And I stand here proclaiming before you that what I told you was the truth, only the truth, and nothing but the truth. And so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all to the truth and to make us humble servants of His. And the last of our prayers is all praises due to Allah, the Lord of everything. And may Allah send His peace and His blessings and exalt the mention of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Break the ice, okay. Um, I'll ask you some question then. Is it an obligation for women to wear the jalbab? Ouch. That's not called breaking the ice. That's burning the place up. But anyways, since we're in that field, might as well do it. Alhamdulillah um, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala bayna Muhammad. Do women have to wear the jilbab? Well, we have to define jilbab. And then we have to define women. But that requires 25 lectures. And time doesn't allow to do so. So we'll focus on the first and briefly speak about the second. The jilbab is an outer garment which women wear for a reason. Now that reason is disputed. Some may agree and some may disagree. However, I have to present to you the Islamic point of view, whether you agree or you disagree. Women in Islam are jewels and diamonds. They're precious. Subsequently, we learn that whatever is precious is usually hidden and covered. That's human standards. That's why you don't put your jewelry on the balcony. Nor do you walk around with money stapled to your shirt. Because it's something which you value, put it in a safe place. Some say also oh, women are like money. So that's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is they are more valuable. They have that value which people cherish. And because of that, it wasn't me or men who told women to put on particular clothing. It was their creator who created men. And he created men with the tendency to like women. And I doubt any man here would reject that. Well, never mind. <laughs> you know what I mean. Is this natural inclination between the two genders. It's very normal. And in regards to that, men behave differently. Some have patience, they have modesty, they have respect. And so they don't do anything about it except whatever comes to their mind when they see nakedness. And they mind their business. But not all men are like that. 
There are some who act upon these scenes and that which they see. And who is victimized? The women. And this doesn't happen once in a blue moon or once every few years. It happens every nine seconds in the United States. Some woman somewhere is raped. So the whole idea is the women cover themselves in order to protect themselves. As Allah clearly stated in the Quran, فَلَا يؤذين, They will not be harmed by weird men, by psycho men, by whatever you want to call them men who exist. Obviously, this is not preferable for women because first, they love beauty and they love to show their beauty. And it's hot outside. So all of these make it difficult to put on some garment which may, may cover the body from top to bottom. However, we believe life is a test. And you cannot pass the test without some struggle, without some effort. You just have to earn it. So the same way you study in school to get a degree, you put on some clothes to go to paradise. It's as simple as that. Now, the outwardly garment, however, is not sufficient if the essence is corrupt. What benefit is there in covering the body when the heart is corrupt? Islam does not call for merely covering up women so that no one sees them. Islam calls for the purification of the soul. The purification of the soul which leads to the purification of the body. So we don't want to focus on one element while ignoring the other. The souls which are purified are the ones which will succeed at the end. And one of the means of attaining the success is following the revealed instructions. Who often go against what we prefer. But then again to earn paradise, we are expected to go against what we prefer. Paradise is not cheap. People fail to realize what is really waiting. What is paradise? It's eternal bliss. No rent. No laundry. No installments for your car. No fighting with the neighbor. No dog chasing you down the street. That's what I heard is happening here. Be careful of that dog. He ran after me yesterday. I said, okay, great. Stay away, dog. None of that. No headache. No worries, no school, no nothing. You'll be having fun forever. And we don't know forever. We have never known forever. Everything we know comes to an end. The only forever is there. And we expect to go there while having a picnic in this world. It's not going to happen. There's something we have to do to earn it. And what we do is not sufficient. It's not like some people say, you know, it, like it's currency. You do good deeds and you purchase paradise. It's way more expensive than that. And the grace of Allah is the condition through which one can enter. However, good deeds were made to be among the means. And the good deeds manifest in doing what is commanded and staying away from what is forbidden. It's a struggle, but the prophets did it. And they succeeded, and we strive to do it so we can succeed. No more icebreakers. No more icebreakers. Do we have a question from a non Muslim guest? Someone would want to use the mic. Simply raise your hand. We don't bite. Because we have written questions. Okay, great. Perfect. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Pontus from Sweden, and I have a question for you, my friend. Yes. Um, if a child is born and uh, raised in a Christian family, mm -hmm. how does that child find the truth? Wonderful. 
Excellent question. If a child is born in a Christian family, and allow me to say, or a Buddhist family, a Hindu family, a Jewish family, whatever, atheist family, how does he find the truth? He finds the truth through the very faculties which God gave us in order to identify the truth. Had we not been able to see, not been able to hear, and not been able to understand and comprehend information, it would become impossible. Because we become more like the animal kingdom who still have these features. However, they can't reason or they cannot analyze information to make decisions. The human quality entails that we have that very ability. And then human experience proves that as well. Let's say that a child is born into a family of architects. And how often does that happen? And the father wants the son to be an architect and the son wants to be a race car driver. And so no matter what the parents say to the child, being an architect is great, you'll make good money, you'll build your own house, and they may give them all kinds of convincing reasons, you find that children will still go against that parental advice because they are inclined towards something. We do this all the time, every day. And so if we're able to abandon the parents' choices and opinions for something that is mundane, something that is worldly, something that is lowly, then how is it that we won't do so in regards to salvation? So just like we leave them alone and we, even though we love them, respect them and everything, still we say, this is my life, it's my choice, I want to live this life. I'm not going to be happy as a dentist. And this happens very often to dentists. I don't... I don't want to open someone's mouth and see all this stuff in there and clean it up for them. It just, it's not my thing. You, my father, you love to be a dentist. I just don't want to do it. So especially if you've had bad experience with bad you know, mouth smell. And so you leave him alone. So we say, okay, if a human being abandons parents because of a, a worldly choice, then religion is even more significant than that. They are able, when they reach the age of discretion, when they're able to understand, they can analyze what is being presented in the world, and they will choose whatever they think will bring them happiness in this life and the life to come. I hope that answers the question. Oops. Sorry, got caught up. Do we have another question? Okay, written question time. Uh, are there any questions about the sisters or about the females? <clears throat> okay, I have a question. How do we know that the Quran is eternal and will never be changed until the end of the world? How do we know that the Quran is eternal? We know that the Quran is eternal because the Quran says about itself it's eternal. And what the Quran says about itself is what Allah said. And so, we understand, however, by the term eternal, that it will remain until the end of time. Yet, at the end of time, one of the signs of the last day is that the Qur'an will be taken away from the people when they stop appreciating it, when they stop acting upon it. The Qur'an will be taken up to the Creator as it was sent down by the Creator. But that will be towards the very end of time. Otherwise, how do we know that it is eternal? Because 1400 years since its revelation, it has remained intact. No changes were made, no revisions were made. Nothing new was produced, nothing was added, nothing was deleted. And so 1400 years is plenty of time for some, some changes to happen. And so we assume that this will be the case similarly until the end of time. And history will prove that, inshallah. Thank you so much. Uh, question? So again, we have plenty of written questions. Okay, great. It says, the Bible never, uh, this is a question by non-Muslim, by the way. The Bible never mentioned about an angel appearing before Moses. What angel was Khadija, radiallahu anh's uncle, the Christian, talking about? Khadija was referring to Gabriel. But then, the person said that that doesn't occur in the Bible. And the question is, 
are facts and the truth relevant to what occurs in the Bible versus what does not occur in the Bible? And the answer is no. There are many things which don't occur in the Bible that are facts. But we all agree to and approve. Some of which are scientific, which the Bible went against. And some of them are of other nature. Now, we're not here to put down the Bible because we Muslims believe that the, guy, the Bible contains some of the teachings of Jesus in the gospel which was, he, which was revealed to him. And the key word is the gospel of Jesus. Now, pay attention to the fact that when you open the Bible, you will not find the gospel of Jesus. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are the, there's the Old Testament and there are the letters of Paul, which he wrote. But there's no gospel of Jesus, which we Muslims believe in. And we don't believe that it was necessarily a book which he was carrying with him when he went around. He was preaching the, the message of Allah. As he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Oh, I promised you to speak about the pronoun our. The Lord our God. Now, I'm a guest from Saudi Arabia and Malaysia. Do I have the right to say, Our hall is pretty nice? Um, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, apparently, the questioner is saying that the question was read out wrong, even though it's written exactly the same. But maybe a correction on the question. Well, let me finish my point before he finishes the point, please, so I will not lose it. Right? The, sometimes you have to be mean. The pronoun our, I don't have the right to say this is our hall, because I am an outsider. If I were to say our hall, then you assume by default that I am a student or a member or I work here, something along these lines. So when you use the pronoun our, that indicates that you are included in the speech. So it's very interesting that Jesus would say to the people, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Even though we're dealing with doctrine, we're dealing with theology, and if any other belief was the one we're supposed to accept, that would be the ideal time to say to the people that the God is, is three in one, the triune God, I, my Father, the Son, anything along these lines would have been the, what we'd expect of Jesus. But we don't find any such statements that are said by Him. We may find some other things that are referred to Him. Then again, it depends on which Bible we are referring to. Is it the Catholic Bible with the 60, 70... Uh, 73 books or the Protestant with the 66 books or the Jehovah Witnesses, then we will have an issue in presenting the actual Bible which represents Christianity. Because of all these conflicts which we have to admit that they exist, we Muslims, while respecting Jesus as much as the Prophet can be respected, while loving him as much as the Prophet can be loved, and believing in the essence of his message, we have to say at the end of the day, the Qur'an is the only reliable revelation to which we can refer and work out any differences. So the fact that the Bible mentions not Gabriel does not mean that Gabriel was not the one who came to Moses and came to Jesus and came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now let's fix that question. Barakallah feek. Okay, question. allow me to expand from that question if you permit me. Hello, how are you? Um, <clears throat> I double checked and yes, it does mention that there is an angel. An angel in uh, Exodus chapter 3 verse 2, it says, an angel, an angel appeared before Moses in the burning bush as a, as a fiery bush. Very good. <laughs> However, in, you will permit me, in verses 3 and, in verses three and 4, it says, Weruak Elohim, Weruak Elohim Tahab Musa, which means, and God spoke to Moses from within the bush. So the voice that later, uh, the voice that later was referred to, Mo to the Moses was not Gabriel, was actually God. And if the Quran says otherwise, I am okay. Mm -hmm. But how come Khadija's uncle, the noted Christian, can actually point out and say that is the same thing that uh, the angel spoke to Moses when the angel at that time never spoke? It was God. Right. The answer to that is, let's assume that uh, Waraka ibn Nawfal was a biblical scholar. Then you can present the same question now to all the biblical scholars in the world and say, how come you have said that this particular verse means such, while this other biblical scholar said it means otherwise? This is if we were to set aside the biblical scholars like Bart Ehrman or others who have reached a point where they abandon completely their belief in the Bible. So I understand where you're coming from, but the truth is, 
it becomes, in, let's say it's Waraka uh, ibn Awfal exerting his biblical knowledge and uh, deducing from the text that that is the same angel. It was just an, an ishtihad, we call it in Islamic uh, you know, uh, science, meaning exerting one's knowledge to bring about a ruling. He could have been right, he could have been wrong. This, by the way, it does not affect the actual revelation. This is only historical facts which led to uh, how the Quran first came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Thank you. So what was it, Exodus? Okay, good. I'll remember this one, Shab. All right, do we have uh, another question? I feel like there's two sons. <laughs> Sorry, eight. Yes. Anyways. Um, is there, is there another question from a non-Muslim guest that, would, that you would like to address? Feel free, please. We insist. Okay. We have a question, Abu Musab, which is, if God exists, why is there so much evil, war in the world? That reminds me of a joke. Sorry, I'm not trying to undermine the value of the question, but I remember a joke someone sent me by email, which actually was about that. They say that, um, you know, a guy, let me try to remember it exactly, the wording of the, the joke. It had to do anyways with uh, a barber. And a, a, a guy said, you know, all these guys with this long hair, you know, what's up with this? It must mean that, Barbers do not exist. Said, well, they do exist, but these people just don't go to the barber. So uh, the idea that there's evil in the world does not suggest that there isn't a creator. In fact, the existence of evil in the world is one of the evidences we use to prove the existence of a creator. How did evil come about? And how did we as human beings have the ability through our natural disposition to actually label it as evil. Why do we all agree that killing someone is wrong? From where did that common feature come? While if you prefer pizza over hamburger, we will differ. No one can come and say, everyone should like hamburger and hate pizza. Because this is a matter where human beings differ, but we don't differ that killing someone who doesn't deserve to be killed, obviously, is a wrong crime. Who is the one who made us all feel this way unanimously? The Creator. And why is there evil? So you may appreciate good. Why are there failures in class? So that you can have people that graduate with honors. If everybody graduated with honors, then what's the big deal? You're not special until you stand out in comparison to others. 20 people that are tall may enter, and you may not really appreciate their height until a short fella like myself comes along. Then I become really short and they become really tall. Because they say through opposites, things become evident. Through the existence of evil, you appreciate good. Now, why did God allow that to happen? Because in the evil that exists, a lot of good comes out. In fact, it is only evil if you look at it from a very limited perspective, while that same thing has many good things. Otherwise, you would not take your son to get a vaccination or a shot, while the fact is someone is putting a needle in his arm. And if it was some other circumstance and someone said, hey, you're walking with your son down the street, someone say, do you mind if I poked your son with a needle? Would you say, oh, please, by all means, go ahead, put a few of them there. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of him anyways. You wouldn't, you say, hey, back off, this is my son. But when he's sick, you take him to the doctor, say, please, puncture him. Because in that what appears to be evil, you expect good. In the death of children, there's good. Say what? I'm telling you, when a child dies, 
according to Islam, he is not accountable. He is not accountable. They go to paradise by default. They don't have to struggle like we do. That's a bonus for them. They didn't have to suffer life like we are suffering life. And their parents, you say, what about the parents? What goodness is that in their parents? The parents, had they been away from the Creator, they will repent because they realize that death can happen to the young. Then what about the old? In the community, there's condolences, there's sharing of love, sharing of emotions, the people coming together because of the death. And we can go on and on in regards to every single thing which appears to be evil. From earthquakes to tsunamis to whatever. It brings about good while there are elements of evil. But it is all under the wisdom of God. The wisdom of Allah. It's all part of the plan. Because this worldly life is not the eternal abode. It is temporary. It is only for some time before we move on to the eternal life. Subsequently, there is that element of testing so that we can live happily in the eternal life. Sacrifice is necessary. I hope that answers that question. Um, do we have another question? Okay. What makes Islam superior over, over all other ways of life? For example, a uh, Christian will state the same. So will a Buddhist, so will a Sikh. Right, this is one of the most difficult questions actually to address because it's an issue of, you know, this is our thing, so our thing must be right. And we admit that a Muslim will tell you Islam is the way of life, Islam will bring you salvation, Islam is the only true religion, but so will the Christian and the Hindu and the Buddhist and the Sikh and the list goes on. So now we have all these paths. All of them are claiming to be the path of salvation. Fine. We say it is possible that each and every one of us can choose whatever one he likes and he will still be able to make it to God. It is possible. Provided that there's one condition. That one condition that all paths are acceptable and will lead to God. The one condition is that they all have identical teachings. You want to name it Islam, Christianity, Judaism, that's, that's your personal business. We're not going to differ on names. But if the core of the message, if the message is the same, identical, sure. Choose the one you like, it's going to take you to God. But the amazing thing is there aren't any two religions on earth who even agree about who God is. Don't ask about the minor issues. What is religion? The belief about God. If the religion itself, no two religions agree about who God is, so how are they all going to go to the same destination when each one of them is leading you in a separate direction about God? It's impossible. The truth is, no two religions agree about who God is. Many can repeat the statement, God is one. There's one God. But then in Hinduism, when you go further, you find that there's more to it. And in Christianity, you will find that there's more to it. And in Islam, you will find that there's nothing else to it. It's just the one God. End of story. We don't have to say which really means that there's such individual who became such individual, then he brought such individual, then this other individual, all these things. Still, we want to push the one God. It just, we don't have to do all that. We say one God, it means one God. Basic English, basic grammar, basic intellect. It's just as plain as that. Because of that, that plain, clear teaching, we submit to you that only Islam is acceptable because it's the only one which maintains the true oneness and uniqueness of the Creator. It does not involve anthropomorphism. It does not involve uh, belittling the God where he becomes lesser than himself. Because if God were to become a man, then it means that God became man. And man is lesser than God. If God became a man, he is no longer God because he lost his qualities of being God. Once you say that, you're done. We can get philosophical, I know. And we can try to justify it, I know that too. But at the end of the day, 
We say it's impossible that Allah created all of us with various intellects. Some are very intelligent, some are okay, some are a little bit on the silly side. We have all kinds of human beings. That's the nicest way to put it. It's impossible that the salvation will be something that only the super intellectual will be able to understand. And we'll have to give you hundreds of explanations as why it makes sense, but you speak to laymen and they say, it just doesn't make any sense to me. The only belief system which can make sense to the average human being, even if he's not that intelligent, is the one presented by Islam. Honestly. So we are not, you know, trying to put down these other religions. We're trying to say, let's not get stuck on being attached to a religion. Let us be attached to the truth. The truth is what, bo what it boils down to. Where is the truth? You analyze, you study, and you will come to the conclusion that Islam presents the truth. I just read an article today that in the UK, in the UK, on average, they're having around 12, 10 to 12,000, some say 15,000 people embracing Islam yearly. Reverts or converts or whatever you want to call them. Even though we are considered to be the terrorists of the world. And we are considered to be the backwards people of the world. And we are considered to be the most... You name it, you know what is being said about us. Yet, yet, people continue to enter into Islam. Either they're crazy or they're right. That wasn't part of the plan. But I guess... So that's what it is. Do we have a? Do we have another question? Um, <laughs> yes, please. He has a question right there. I want to appreciate your message, though that I came uh, not too late, but then at least. Uh, behind schedule. Uh, I know one thing that vengeance is of the Lord. Vengeance is of the Lord. To avenge. No. Vengeance? Yeah, it's of the Lord. It's of God. Uh -huh. Vengeance is of yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. And you, in your speech or in your message, you talk about terrorism, though I couldn't just grab that. Uh, what is the connection, what is the uh, correlation between Islam and terrorism? Uh, because it's becoming a daily trend in the world. And which, probably I want to put it, a layman, or perhaps those who does not uh, well uh, rooted in religion, perhaps either Islam or Christianity, believe in that. Islam is, has a link with terrorism. And I believe it, is, it may be a misconception, but then I believe we can throw a light towards that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, they say that a guy came to work and he was feeling perfectly okay. And someone said to him, hey man, what's wrong with you? You look sick. He said, I'm not sick. I'm okay. I'm perfectly okay. He said, no, no, you look sick. I said, look, I, tell, I know myself. I'm good. He went. Another employee came and said, hey man, what's wrong with you? You look sick. He said, yeah, I'm a little sick. I'm a little sick. He said, okay, you know, you need to, you need to take some rest. He said, okay. A third person came and said, hey, what's wrong with you? You look sick. He said, I'm very sick, man. I need to go home. What am I trying to say? If people continue to bombard you with information, you will start believing it. And this is, by the way, this example is proven by psychology. Doctors made that experiment. That if you continue to tell someone something, they will start believing it. That's why a man is always told to tell his wife, you're beautiful. <laughs> right? And then she will always tell him, how could you leave me? You said I was beautiful. 
So this is a fact. So now what is CNN and Fox News and all these lovely fellas out there are saying all the time? They are so afraid of the spread of Islam, there's absolutely no way to stop us. They have no means to stop the spread of Islam except media propaganda. Either we submit or we will use our mind. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Afghanistan is being attacked. Palestine is being attacked. Shall I name the countries? Iraq is being attacked. Where else can I go except that Muslims are being killed? We are the victims of terrorism. We are the biggest victim of terrorism. And, but what do they do? They say, look, as soon as you try to fight back, you become the terrorist and they are the freedom fighters. And people believe. But that's not fair. You will not, you will not let someone come into your house and smack you around, rape your family, and say, I'm going to live in this house in spite of you. And say, here's the other cheek. Go ahead, be my guest. I love for you. You're my neighbor. Mm -mm. And even if people say that, they don't do that. The truth of the matter is, Muslims are often simply, simply defending themselves. But let me add something else. Terrorists. We are terrorists. Now you tell me, I'm not going to speak about individuals. I don't deny there are people in the world of Islam who do act in a manner that is against Islam, which you can label as terrorism. No doubt in my mind. I know it. You know it. There's no point in denying it. But it is not fair to judge Islam per the actions of some Muslims. Otherwise, all Christians are crusaders. But they're not. And all Jews are Zionists, but they're not. We know that there are groups amongst every religion that are military. That's it. But let me tell you in terms of the teachings. Now, I wish that the United Nations or any other, you know, Geneva, whatever they call it, anyone will present these etiquettes of war. We believe that there's war. Because you have the right to defend yourself. Otherwise, if defending yourself was a crime, then I call on to all the countries in the world to, th to throw their weapons in the ocean. But they won't. They have army and marine and navy. Why? Because someone may attack us. And we have to be ready to defend our soil, our land, our honor, our whatever. Okay, and Islam is what? Islam is a nation like any other nation. And we have equal rights. But you tell me a nation which says to the people, do not kill women, do not kill children, do not kill elderly, do not kill those dedicated to worship. Whatever religion, he's in his church, he's in his temple, whatever he may be, don't approach them. Do not burn a tree, do not destroy a house, do not kill an animal, do not betray, do not act treacherously. Which nation on earth applies these in their warfare? None. They bomb milk factories, they bomb children, they bomb women, and kill innocent civilians. Every single day, right before our eyes. And they're not terrorists, subhanAllah. They're not. We are the terrorists. Even though we have these guidelines 1400 years ago that no one ever had and no one will ever have. So let us set the thing straight. Some Muslims misrepresenting Islam through violent acts such as going to a supermarket or a train station and bombing themselves in the name of Allah, we say Islam is the first to say this is prohibited. First, you cannot commit suicide. Second, you cannot kill innocent civilians. What Islam permits is that if the two armies meet, like armies are meeting all the time, then you have the right to do what you have to do on the battlefield. People buying vegetables to have lunch are not included. 
So to kill them in the name of Allah is oppression. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يزال المسلم في فسحة من دينه ما لم يصب دما حراما. The believer will remain within the margins of his religion unless he spills blood illegally. Once he kills one innocent soul, he will be held responsible by Allah and it may be the reason he will enter the hellfire. It's a very serious crime to kill people, period. So these are the things we have to do. Go back to the teachings of Islam, not from the internet. Don't go to Sheikh Google. He is misguided. He's off the track. He quotes Wikipedia. And I don't know what else. I mean, you put one, one keyword and you will get 100 conflicting results. So people go think they've discovered everything. They go on, you know, on the internet, put Islam and terrorism, and they get all these articles by people who don't really, you know, represent us, nor do they share the truth and say, oh, oh okay, khalas, I figured it out. No, that's not fair. You, we have the Quran. Read it. See what Allah says about kill, killing innocent souls. And you will find in the Quran Allah telling the believers how to deal with the battlefield. People love to quote those. Kill them wherever you find them. They don't bother to read the context. They don't bother to know about the, the history of these ayat. And so they come up with their own conclusions without them justifying them. But this is not fair approach. Read the Quran. Read the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it will become clear to you that Islam is against terrorism in the way it is done today. Meaning innocent and terrorizing innocent people who, are, who have done nothing except that they live in some country or they have a particular ethnicity. So you try to wipe them out. Islam is the first to condemn and to be against this kind of behavior. And we have to realize that through the reliable sources. If you wish, I can email you some. And you know, you can share them and you can read them to come to that realization yourself. Okay? Beautiful. All right. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, another question? Oh. Uh, personal reflection, if you may. If you may. Um, perhaps would you like to share uh, to everyone here to to confirm, solve that issue. Just two case questions, if you may, if I may. Um, first of all, on September 11th, when the plane hit the building, and it so happened that the next, the next few days, the jihadi stood up and says that we claim responsibility, and we did this in vengeance of what you have abused, the Islamic nation. How did you feel about that? And then the second one, when Osama bin Laden was reported to have been killed by the, US, by the, by the US Navy SEALs and, as, and, by, uh, and by practice and by application to what you mentioned, he is then going to be questioned before God Almighty and therefore sent to the hellfires. How do you feel about that too? Beautiful. September 11, now this may sound a little crazy, but I'm not one who lies. I was living in Staten Island and those who know New York, they know where Staten Island is. And I saw the event with these two eyes, not four, because I didn't have glasses then. <laughs> I saw it. But guess how I saw it? On TV. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. I'm living on Staten Island, and I, it's an island that is remote to Manhattan, you take a ferry boat, which will take you to Manhattan, from there you take the trains to wherever you want to go, Brooklyn, Queens, whatever. And I'm living on Staten Island, and the place where I live, I can see the Brooklyn Bridge, the Statue of Liberty, and the Twin Towers. I'm sleeping, it's maybe, I don't remember, it was early in the morning, I'm sleeping. And all of a sudden, I start getting, my phone starts ringing and ringing and ringing. And you know how annoying that is when you're sleepy. I pick up the phone, it's my friend Jamie, who lives in Los Angeles. He says, hey man, look outside the window. Why is he telling me that? Because I just told him a few days ago, where I'm living now, 
the view before me is all of the following. The one I mentioned earlier. I said, are you crazy waking me up in the morning to look outside the window and you're in Los Angeles? He said, shut up and do it. I said, sure. I look outside the window and there's a building on fire. One building on fire. I'm thinking to myself, this is a fire. The way it appeared, it was some floors on fire. They will come, you know, the, they will come and the firefighters will come and put it out. And end of story. Then the bell starts to ring downstairs. Now my friends who know that they can see from above are trying to come upstairs. And it's happening continuously. I turn on the TV screen to see what the news have to say about the event. So I'm standing here, there's the window, and I'm standing here, there's the TV. The people are coming up, and what, I got tired of seeing fire, just, you know, because it's very far. You don't actually see except fire. I'm so bored looking at the building, I just watch the TV. And while I'm watching the TV, the other plane hit. That's why I saw it on TV. I could have been looking outside the window at that moment, but Allah decreed that I wasn't doing so. Does that make a difference? However, no. Because when that happened, we all took the streets. All of us went down. We tried to go over there. They did not allow us to go there. The ferry boats were prevented from going back and forth for security and safety reasons. However, what is the first piece of information that was consistently conveyed to us? Mind you, mind you, back then I was a rapper. I was not a Muslim. I was born a Muslim, but back then, at that stage of my life, I was a rapper. Not wrapping sandwiches, even though I did that. <laughs> I did wrap sandwiches. I was rapping, I was a loser, you may say, but still I made an attempt, part of a group called Scums of the Earth. And we were really the scums of the earth. Anyways, I was, the last thing on my mind was Islam and, and all this stuff. I really didn't care. So we go down and we're speaking to the different people. The one piece of information which everyone seemed to agree about, be it Americans or non-Americans, Muslims or non-Muslims, is that on that day, 3,000 Jews just didn't go to work. And it was not a coincidence. That was from the moment it happened. Surely, if you go back some time later, and you see what the activists did in terms of studying the whole issue and the documentary which you can find on YouTube, you will come to realize that it was an inside job. I don't deny that maybe some Muslims were used as puppets to carry it out. Allah knows best. As a Muslim, I cannot presume something and dismiss it just because I don't like it. It could be that they used some, it could be that they didn't. Nevertheless, it wasn't that something that the Muslims did on their own. And if they did, it is wrong. If they did, it is wrong. And it was wrong, and it will continue to be wrong. So that was not a happy moment, because nothing good was done. In fact, it made our life worse. And even though it made our life worse outwardly, many people entered into Islam because of that very event. So the evil which we spoke about earlier, that appears to be evil, Allah brings goodness out of it. We don't want it to be this way. But the truth is that this happened. So whether this or any other event, when any Muslim kills any non-Muslim, the first feeling that I would have in any Muslim is, why? Why are you misrepresenting us? We work hard to try to portray the truth of Islam and you ruin it with a single act out of ignorance. We're never happy. Nor was I happy about Osama bin Laden. But then again, when we speak about such individuals, I am very, very skeptical. Because I watched, I watched movies. What was the name of the dinosaurs? Jurassic Park, yes. I watched these movies and they made these dinosaurs look real. And I believe in Hollywood. And I believe in Bollywood. <laughs> and I believe in acts. And I believe in lies. And I believe in people make, made to appear like people. I don't trust anything that comes to me from the media. I'm sorry. 
It could all be just a fairy tale as far as I know. He could be real, he could be fictional. They could have gotten him, he could still be away. Maybe they killed him many years ago, I don't know. And because I don't know, I don't assume. But we say, by principle, if he did kill all these innocent people, all of them are in his neck on the day of judgment. And Allah will deal with him the way Allah knows is just and fair. But I cannot say this individual is ABC because I don't know. I didn't meet him. He didn't tell me in person that he did ABC. And I didn't see anything with my own eyes. It's all coming to me from unreliable sources. And Allah teaches the Muslims in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, in ja'akum fasikum binaba'in, fatabayyanu. An tusibu qawman bi jahalatin, fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimin. Oh, you have believed? If a corrupt individual brings news to you, verify it. Lest you wind up oppressing people wrongfully while you don't know and then you will become regretful over it. And because the media is corrupt as far as I'm concerned, their information is not reliable, then I verify. I don't have the means of verification. I don't assume anything they say to be true or false. It remains in the boundaries of questionable. So Osama bin Laden, personally to me, is questionable. But by principle, if he did what he did or anyone else, Islam is rejected and is against it. Now. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you very much. We're almost coming to a close. Um, do we have any additional questions? We have plenty of written questions. Brother Adil, what he just asked me right now is, uh, why don't you ask Abu Musab about his personal rapping background? Hey! <laughs> hey, hey! Give me the mic! Oh, I got a mic. No, no, that stuff is over. That stuff is over because we thought we were cool. And we thought we understood life. And we thought we had it happening. You know, we were the guys, man. Everything you see in, on TV, we were living it. But then at the end, people with sexually transmitted diseases that are not curable, alhamdulillah Allah protected us. People who are drug addicts who can't stop smoking weed because it's their purpose of life. If he has a joint, he's happy. If he doesn't, he wants to commit suicide. People that don't even communicate with their parents disrespect their parents, take advantage of their parents, people that fight with one another, disrespect one another in the name of art. This rapper dissed that rapper, East Coast, West Coast, Tupac, Biggie Smalls. <laughs> Jewelry, you know, yo, yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, excuse me, Mr. Cool Guy. I've come to realize that coolness is in obedience. And if I really want to be cool, I can only do so in paradise. The level of coolness that I have now, or we can have now, is restricted by the divine guidelines. You can be cool within a particular margin. If you want to go beyond that to be cool, you're going to be hot later on. <laughs> you follow me? And it's not the kind of heat which you can get rid of. It's, it's permanent. So we leave off that coolness and that hotness and we stick to what is pleasing to Allah. Rapping on stage is not one of the things which will get you closer to your creator. Reciting is revelation will. However, because it's in something in me, I write poetry. You can still write poetry. I'm not telling you, you know, kill your talent. Write poetry and publish it in a book and have a profound message in it. No problem. But to display it in a fashion of showing off and belittling others and cursing them out and using foul language and all that stuff, it's not necessary and it is not allowed per the teachings of Islam. Otherwise, if I were to give you the history, then it will be a whole other discussion. But uh, time doesn't allow. Jazakallah khairan. Um, before I move on, do you have any lines of poetry that you could share with us off, off the back of your head? Um, 
Well, I, you see, I, when I, let me tell you the truth. Back then, I was either writing or freestyling. Okay? Now, when you freestyle, you know, you just say whatever comes to mind. And when you write, I would memorize it. But once I started writing poetry, I stopped memorizing it because I have other evidences I have to memorize. And so I don't have anything memorized. I don't know whether my phone will aid me. Uh, I don't know whether I've kept any of them here, actually. I really doubt I have. Uh, but uh, maybe we can do this uh, if I don't have it in a, in a future occasion. I'm not a great poet. You don't think you're going to hear something you know, that would blow your mind. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a while to find it. Anyways, either, even as a poet, I suck. <laughs> Maybe that will save me the, the headache. We have our last written question, even though there are more questions, but they're very redundant. So, uh, any additional question? Otherwise, we'll call it with this last question. Uh, for non-Muslims on the mic. All right, okay. Thank you. Um, the question goes, hi. Hey. What is it like to become a new Muslim? Um, and also, why would one want to be a Muslim and what would he gain? What could push one towards Islam? How does it feel to become a new Muslim? Well, I'm not supposed to have experienced this, but I have. Because like I said, I was born into a Muslim family, but we were pretty much Christian. We did not practice anything that was related to Islam, not even fasting, surely not praying. But we would have Christmas and Easter's and everything you can think of. We actually used to have a Christmas tree and my dad would hire a Santa Claus to drop off a gift at midnight. <laughs> not that many people do that. I would actually wake up and see a big old man going in there, leaving a gift and leaving. So anyways, we were totally off. And I remained to be in this fashion until I moved from my home country, Lebanon, to this other country, which I told you about earlier. And there I became a Buddhist. Uh, not Buddhist as in someone who was uh, uh, concerned with the actual individual Buddha. But there's a form of Buddhism which is prevalent there that has to do with the law of cause and effect or karma. Maybe you are aware of that, maybe you're not. But what we would do is we would have what they call a butsanon, it's like a little bookshelf, with some written material in it by some of their leaders, and we would go like this behind and say, Nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo, for many hours, hoping to change our karma from evil to good. Okay, because they believed in reincarnation. So if you die while in a state of evil, you may come back as a rat, mouse, or that dog which we were talking about earlier. And if you die in a state of good, you'll be a king, a president, a minister, something fancy. No, anyways, I was way off track and then I embraced Islam, even though I was supposed to be a Muslim. How does it feel? It's a relief. You know, the... <sighs> finally. Finally, I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. I know the direction I have to follow. I know the maximum speed. I know all the signals which will, I will come across. I know when to stop, when to move, how much gas. Everything is laid out. Before that, everything was not. I was confused because everybody had something to say. So why would you become a Muslim or what is the benefit of becoming a Muslim? It's just going in the right direction. It's just about going in the right direction that will lead you to eternal life. We have become so materialistic that we don't care about eternal life. We just don't want to think about it. We don't want to think about death. We don't want to think about responsibility. It's much easier to say, enjoy it, have fun, and worry about it later, if ever. But that is not being honest with oneself. Because we see death every day. Because of that, you need something that tells you exactly what's happening. And from my humble experience, and I have experienced religions and different followers of different religions, there isn't a religion which lays it out for you completely with absolutely no ambiguity. Clear like the sun that this is the way which will ensure your success in this life and in the life to come. 
On the expense of what? On the expense of abandoning your desires. Is the message one which tells you to reject the prophets or the messengers? No. It is one which tells you believe in all the prophets and the messengers. They say that they were a Jewish rabbi, a Christian theologian, and a Muslim scholar. They were all invited to a TV show. And uh, this TV show is known for presenting controversial topics to the audience. And they have millions of viewers. So the host brought all of them and said, Look, each one of you claims that his prophet, that belief in his prophet and his book is the key to paradise and salvation. Each one of you makes that claim. Correct? They said, correct. He said, we would like you to prove to the viewers why is it the case. So, of course, they said to the Jewish rabbi, since he's the oldest among them in terms of the religions, he said, you go ahead and explain your point of view. He said, it's okay. We will let the Christian do so. So they said to the Christian, go ahead and do so. He said, it's okay. Let the Muslim speak first. They said, okay, now it's on you. He said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad amma ba'd. If believing in Moses in the Torah is the key to paradise, then we Muslims are going along with the Jews because we believe in the Quran, we believe in the Torah, and we believe in Moses. And if believing in Jesus and his gospel is the key to paradise, then we Muslims shall also go along with the Christians because we believe in the gospel and we believe in Jesus. But if believing in the Quran and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the key to paradise, we are going on our own. Because neither the Jews nor the Christians believe in the Muhammad or in the Quran. And the show was over. There was nothing else to say. No religion on earth will bring this kind of flexibility, this kind of moderation towards the previous messengers and their messages. No other faith on earth. No other faith. So why Islam? Because that only Islam has these characteristics. The problem is most human beings, most human beings love life too much to sacrifice. They know. Allah knows that within their heart, deep inside, they know. But it is difficult to humble oneself and to admit to the truth and abandon the old ways. Very, very difficult. Old habits die hard. People are not willing to do it. Who are those who embrace Islam? The individuals that are able to get over these obstacles to defeat their own, their own conceitness, their conceitedness, excuse me, their own ego, and be able to make that bold move. It's not easy, but it is worth it. So I hope that some of those who have recognized the truth of Islam in their heart, after the questions were answered and the misconceptions were removed, of course there are some who still are not knowing about everything, continue to learn and ask. But those who have reached that stage, it is time that you return to your Lord. It is time that you repent to your Lord. When you do so, He shall bless you and guide your path. And He will make life easy for you. He will facilitate your affairs. He will grant you inner happiness and contentment. And when you meet Him at the, on the day of judgment, He will give you eternal paradise and bliss. And the companionship of the prophets and the messengers. Which is the most valuable thing which any human being can attain. No. All right, Khair, thank you so much. I think we're going to call it to a close. But before I do, just want to mention that we have a talk tomorrow, which I'll ask Abu Mus'ab to give a teaser about. Tomorrow's talk, are we coming to an end? Same venue, same time, 6 p.m. sharp, though. Are we coming to an end 2012? But before you do share that teaser with us and call it to a close, um, we're also going to have some activities such as pick up basketball games. Abu Mus'ab is, mashallah, pretty good. I mean, he laid that ankle breaker on me and my ankle was gone. Uh, mashallah, he's really, really good. So we're going to have a pickup basketball game, inshallah. We'll, we'll let you guys know at the, at the masjid. Uh, for tomorrow's lecture, same venue, 6 p.m., teaser. Can you share it with us in the call too? Yeah, will, will the world come to an end in 2012? And I think it, it is 2012, right? Last time I checked. 
And so uh, it seems that according to some, خلاص, we're almost there. The whole thing is gonna, uh, you know, vanish. This world is going to vanish. But we submit to you that there are many signs which were prophesied by the Prophet sallallahu and even previous prophets about the signs of the last day. And that until these signs materialize, this world shall not come to an end. And so we will be presenting this point of view so that you will just have general knowledge. You may not necessarily accept them at this point, but just so you'll see what is the Islamic perspective in regards to someone saying the world will end this year or in this such year or after 50 years or whatever. And what are the things which we should expect before the actual world comes to an end? And does anyone know exactly the date? All these questions inshallah will be answered in tomorrow's lecture. You are all invited to come and uh, uh, you know, uh, honor us by your presence. So I hope you make that move. Yes, oh, by the way, I have a website. I'm the, worst pers I'm the worst person to represent his own website. That's what I've learned over the years. Uh, I have a website which if you want to check out, you could. It's called uh, onewaytoparadise.net. I have to include the joke. Do not go to onewaytoparadise.com. It's a travel agency. They will send you to Hawaii. <laughs> and so please remember the .net. One way to paradise. O N E W A Y T O P A R A D I S E. Dot net. And then you'll find a lot of material, audio, video, what have you. Then there's a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash one way to paradise. And there is also the Facebook, even though I sometimes visit it, also Facebook One Way to Paradise. And the email, if you wish to insult me or attack me or do whatever you wish, mafi mushkila. You go ahead and do so at one way to paradise at gmail.com. Okay, for the Muslims, I don't answer questions on that website. But for the non Muslims, feel free to agree, disagree, share your views, even if it is offensive, insulting. I've become, you know, I just don't care. I'm like, you know, beating a dead horse. You just say whatever you want, it goes from this ear out of this one. I'll take it in a very, you know, a very good uh, way, inshallah. Because I've been attacked many times in my life. And so another attack is not going to make much of a difference. But feel free to share with me your views on what you heard, whether it is positive or negative, at one way to paradise at gmail.com. So basically everything that has to do with one, one way to paradise, YouTube, Facebook, the website, is uh, at your, uh, you know, disposal. All right. I think we're called to a close. I'm not going to really conclude it because you also have a talk tomorrow. As for our non-Muslim guests, if you'd like to stay back and if you have some questions for Abu Mus'ab, you're welcome to do so. As for our Muslim brothers and sisters, we're called to a close. Shall we have the talk tomorrow? And the Isha Adhan is going to be given right now to pray Isha prayers. It's already time. Jazakumallah khairan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tawbu ibi.